did you uh, get the filter I told you? Uh, yeah, it's fine. Um, I think All Abby. Right. I think Abby okay, wants perfect. to go in, so I'm just going to. Yeah. So we have. Uh... Okay. Let me see. Just give me a sec. Uh, let's see. All right. So I guess the first question we have is sure, from John. Avi, you're unmuted. Oh, hey, there we go. Um, so this is for um, JF. So I guess the first question I have is, what would be your goalpost to be convinced that the majority of the black-white racial IQ gap is, in fact, environmental rather than genetic? So what kind of study design would you um, want to see done? And then oh, the somebody... second... oh, go ahead. Sure, sure. And then the second question is I just wanted to know if you've seen this paper, I'll post it in debate, where they try to do a multivariate adjustment model for different environmental factors. And the idea is that once they did that, the racial factor was no longer statistically significant in the G intercept uh, to predict uh, between blacks and whites. So the idea is when they they're asserting that when they adjusted for a variety of environmental factors, that the difference in uh, gap uh, not only was uh, almost all explained, that race barely played uh, any role after those adjustments. And if you didn't see the paper, it's totally fine. I can you can go through it and pour through it, and we can talk about it another time. Um, well, but yeah, I have clicked on the paper and it says 404 not found. Oh, okay. Hold I'm on. Let me, sure. let me, uh... But in any case, I can answer your first question while you figure out the link. Uh, and it relates to a big misunderstanding by Sunseed of what is a twin study. You will hear from his conclusion. Clearly, he said that in twin studies, black children were separated from their parents later or adopted later than white children. That is absolutely ridiculous. That is not what a twin study is. He's referring to transracial adoption study. So he doesn't even understand what twin studies are and in fact understand that twins cannot be of different races. Twins must be of the same race. Uh, ex <laughs> extreme exceptions left aside. Uh, that being said, the threshold that I would accept as evidence to demonstrate that something is not related to genes and related ra rather to the environment is simply a twin study that would have enough subjects in it and that would end up with a linear returns factor uh, that is very low, maybe lower than 0 0.3, 0 0.2, but that's not what we see. We see dozens of these studies always returning factors above 0 0.3 and in fact most of the time we estimated between 0 0.5 and 0 0.8 so that is just the proportion of the differences between individuals explained by genes and that's my threshold the twin study returning a contrary result so just so by the way i posted the um the study if you want to find it so the twin correct me if i'm wrong but the twin study um, that just gives you the est doesn't that just give you the estimate of how um, heritable this trait is, how much explain uh, explanatory power the uh, genes are in relation to to non gene explanations? But the question that we're asking isn't exactly that. The question that we're asking is, with respect to the racial IQ difference, like something could be um, largely heritable, something could be very her heritable, but it could still be true that the racial IQ gap could be largely explained due to environmental factors. Both of those things could be true at the same time. And so my yeah, question yeah. is really just how would you parse those two things apart? Like, let's say you're right about the about IQ being largely heritable. Let's just posit that you're completely correct about that. It still could be the case that the racial IQ gap could be largely explained due to environmental factors. And so my question is, what type of study would you have designed in, in order to meet your threshold for accepting that the majority of it is, in fact, due to environment, With the, specifically yeah, yeah. the racial IQ gap? I don't deny the possibility that you mentioned. You can think of a world in which, okay, within the whites, 
genetic differences explain all intelligence differences but still but then you compare the white population to another population and suddenly it's all environmental now i, I would need uh, several things to adhere to this possibility as being a, a serious one first you need to make the thinking here what kind of world would allow this what kind of world would allow that for some reason in europe People have evolved with genes influencing IQ, but for some reason in Africa, you would have a total malleability of IQ, the likes of which we don't have even within the white population. Uh, it's a very bizarre world, one in which you would have to explain this through evolutionary pressure. Now, it doesn't make it impossible, but it certainly raises the threshold where you say, oh my God, what are what is the possibility that this would exist a world that where the the iq has been selected in africa to be malleable is there a particular reason why that would be the case is there an advantage to having a malleable iq in african society i don't know of any of this and so in the absence of evidence for this i would i would say it's a very unlikely hypothesis that being said, there is a path of uh, evidence that we can use to make these conclusions. And it is a combination of GWAS, genome-wide association studies, and uh, ultimately comparison of the results of these GWAS with interracial uh, differences in genomes. And this has been done by David Pfeiffer. Uh, the title of the article is Evidence for Recent Polygenic Selection on Educational Attainment and Intelligence, inferred from GWAS ITS. And what Pfeiffer does is he takes all of the genes that we find to be correlated with intelligence. Now, it's certainly too many genes, and it's certainly too many SNPs. Uh, we have about a thousand sites of DNA where we find correlation between them and intelligence. It doesn't tell you that each of these letters cause the differences of intelligence between individuals, but it certainly tells you that within these 1,000, there must be some that are the underlying cause of the recorded differences between twins. That's what a GWAS allows you to take. It's the pool of possible genes. Now, when we look at the pool of possible genes that are linked to intelligence, and we look at their distributions across races, we find differences that are absolutely compatible with the idea that these genes influence intelligence and that they are ultimately the reason why we observe the differences between races. So, for example, they can use just the link between each letter of DNA and IQ and compute what they call a polygenic score, which is a score where, okay, I'm going to score the possibility that you're going to have 83 IQ or 85 IQ or 87 IQ. And each piece of DNA that we find that is linked, that we know to be linked to intelligence is included in that super calculation, which results in the polygenic score. As it turns out, the polygenic score obtained from limited samples of populations explain extremely well how different populations that were not even part of the original sample, why they would have lower or higher IQ. In other words, just from the polygenic score uh, done with the GWASs in with largely European and American subjects, we can already predict uh, based on the genome differences known to occur with Africa and with Asia, we can already predict that essentially the polygenic score returns a lower score for Africa and a higher score for Asia, as if within those genetic differences must be contained the proper information to conclude one's IQ at adult age. That is one technique that allows you to go beyond the twin study and make an affirmation of likelihood with respect to genes and their relation to racial differences okay um my understanding so i'm familiar with some gwas studies and like is my understanding with mendelian randomization studies which are not exactly gwas necessarily gwas but they are similar um my understanding you could correct me if i'm wrong is that um when you use like appropriate um Corrections, statistical corrections for multiple comparisons, such as Bonferroni corrections. So it doesn't have to be Bonferroni. It could be like um, 
uh, hall step out, or it could be step down methods or step up methods. But when you do the, that, you find that the, um, the the scores account for a very small percentage of the variance of intelligence um, in the normal range of your sample. Um, you could, and that could be anywhere from uh, one point six percent to three point something percent. Um, maybe sometimes you can see four percent of the variance accounted for. And so, yes, it could be the case that you, the polygenic uh, score that is um, being used for intelligence can be higher or lower in one given race rather than the other. But this, I don't see how this is really answering the question, what quantity of that gap is really being explained by uh, those genes? And so I, without just, I, I just don't see why we wouldn't use the same thing we do in uh, general epidemiology, we do like a large prospective cohort study and we control for confounding factors and multivariate adjustments. I don't know why that type of evidence is not on the table, but maybe it is. I don't know. You tell me. Well, uh, you have a big problem in GWAS. You, you've mentioned the bon Ferrani correction. It's that we know these statistical corrections to be too abusive. We know that when we're applying them, we're cutting ourselves from much of the knowledge that we could have, but we're making a trade-off between knowledge and certainty, essentially. And someone applying a bon Ferrani correction is asking, really, please tell me the, the genes that you're absolutely sure are linked to, to intelligence. That's what's happening, knowing, of course, that by doing that, you will deprive yourself of 95% of the relevant genes that truly are linked, but that you'll never know because you've applied this threshold. Now, I'm back to my original argument. Of course, the GWAS studies are- Wait, Jeff, just real quick, just, just real quick. I, I didn't limit it to Bonferroni. I, you, I specified you can do all sorts of corrections that are, have more power than Bonferroni. I, like, I understand Bonferroni is conservative, but you can use Sadak well, procedure, Tupi's procedure, uh, home step down, Hoshberg step up. And it's always a trade-off. Yeah. Any sort of correction, of these corrections that are meant to correct for multiple comparison, any of them, even those I don't know the name of, must by definition be too conservative because of the trick they do mathematically. Uh, it's really that they make it very, very hard to meet the positive threshold. Uh, that being said, I'm not super worried about this because you're bringing it really to a separate question, which I've not really taken position on, which is the genes that we know to be linked to, to intelligence, how much variance can they explain? I don't have a strong position on this because I don't have a position that we know the genes to be linked to intelligence. My only position is that it is genes that are linked to intelligence and that they uh, have a strong effect on intelligence. I don't claim that I know which ones, and the GWAS are really designed to determine which ones. I'm not so much interested in which ones. I think it's a question for eventually geneticists and neuroscientists. But then we're back to the twin studies, the twin studies and the, the reflection I've shared earlier, even without the GWAS. It's like, why would we have this special population in the middle of Africa for some reason, having evolved to be super plastic in their intelligence, and all the other population would have evolved to have uh, differences between them that are all encoded in genes or largely encoded in genes? It's a very, <laughs> I don't see why you would have this. Wait, so wait. So you're back to the impossibility, the, the improbability of it. Wait, so sir, you would seriously, for a GWAS study, you, you take the view that you shouldn't use any problem of multiple comparisons, corrections, and you would just set a p-value at 0 0.5 for everything, even though you yeah, have like 10 to the power. Said. Is that your position or no? no? That's not what I said. So what I said, yeah. my position is, use this multiple comparisons correction knowing what you are trading off. You are trading off knowledge for certainty. And don't be surprised at the end that you have little knowledge and lots of certainty. Sure, uh, but if you don't... To interrupt you guys up, but we do have other people who want to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry, sorry. Okay, we can continue this another time. Real, yeah. real quick, yeah. Oh, but Jeff, real sorry, quick, there, here's the... Pa t tell me if this link works for the paper that I'm sending you. Um, yeah, I got it. Um, I mean, I've never seen this paper. I would have to read in detail. Uh, people who have attempted to do this in the past have been serious at it. So I would be surprised that a study out of nowhere has done something that is absolutely stunning. But I'm willing to read it and see where I see the problems in it. Okay, cool. Thanks. 
All right, perfect. Thanks, guys. Well, do you mind if uh, I uh, clarify something? Because JF pointed out, like, there was a mistake I made. I was conflating uh, my critique of uh, just these transracial studies with the critique of uh, twin studies. Um, and uh, I believe JF is correct. My, the, the correct, the, the critique I wanted to make was that um, one of the methodological issues with the twin studies was the claim that these uh, twins were uh, were reared apart, baking it so uh, you can control for the environmental factors. But that that wasn't true. These twins weren't reared apart. So that was the methodological issue that I was pointing out. Uh, not the more specific one that I made against trans uh, racial studies. So, right. so I to clarify that. Okay, so uh, now we're just going to uh, proceed to the other questions. Um, this is a question for both uh, from No Man Cry. I guess this is a sort of uh, generic question and it relates to the whole uh, debate. He's, he's asking to both, how important is IQ to success in life? And I'm assuming by success, he means um, material success, I guess. I'm not a big fan of IQ. I don't attach importance to IQ. I say to all people, no matter what your cognitive properties are, you can find uh, happiness in this world. Thank you. 